Okay, so members, you're very welcome to today's meeting. Uh, can I check, first of all, if we have any apologies for today's meeting? Okay, that's grand. Uh, and that allows us, with it being a single agenda item meeting, we can proceed then and move to item two of our agenda today, which is to welcome a discussion on European affairs and an evidence session with the EU uh, Vice President, Mr Sefcovic. So if we can welcome uh, Dr Sefcovic to our meeting and uh, hopefully we can see him. And in the time-honoured tradition, he's just dro dropped, off. dropped off that meeting. So um, we will take a moment or two to see if we can get him uh, back into the uh, spotlight element of the meeting, and then we'll be able to commence. <clears throat> so it could be, hopefully, have him back online. I think it's it. Normally at this point that we ask Martina to sing a song for us, but uh, we, may <laughs> we may hold off for maybe just a moment to see if we can uh, get Dr. Sefcovic back onto the uh, logged in again. I don't know, but we'll await that day. Go here. Yeah, yeah Alice has got there. There we go. And we've got... Uh, back online again. Okay. Okay, so uh, we can see now that we have contact through to Dr. Sefcovic's office there and hopefully to himself. It looks a bit clunky. Yeah. That's the worst. <laughs> okay, so I'm hoping that um, Dr. Sefcovic can hear us okay. Uh, are you able to hear us there? Yes, I can, I can hear you and I can see you. Excellent. And we are trying to fix the camera on me so you can see me as well. So hopefully it will work out. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. It's, it's great that we've got the connection established there and that we can commence the meeting with you. Maybe just with the meeting dropping off, just to let you know, uh, Dr. Sefcovic, that we are actually live and that the meeting is being broadcast. So just to make you aware of that, that we've already started into the meeting. OK, so um, you're very welcome to our committee meeting today. Uh, we're honoured to have you with us. And I certainly appreciate you giving us all of your time. And indeed that this is uh, the first meeting with a committee here or in any of the devolved assemblies. And we really appreciate being that first. Um, Vice President, I am of the perspective that we should never have had Brexit. Uh, the majority of people here did not vote for it. And the majority in our assembly do not support it. However, we are a democracy and the majority of people across the UK did support it and we are where we are. And I know that the negotiations have been difficult and multi-tiered. Uh, you work with the British government, but of course they have a view that differs from the majority of people here. And when our executive office ministers meet to discuss Brexit, they do so in a joint office, but that too is not entirely representative of the views of the people of the North. So I welcome you to our committee because it is, I feel, the most representative of this place. Our committee is made up of views that best reflect what people in Northern Ireland are thinking on both sides of the debate. And I know that the questioning today with yourself will be positive, productive, and it will be polite. So I welcome the chance to have this conversation with you uh, about the implementation of the protocol on the island of Ireland. And I would invite you, if you would like, to make some opening remarks, and then we can move to some questions. I think we just have you on, on mute there, uh, Vice President. Maybe. If... Yes, is it better? Now? That's better. Yes, thank you. Excellent. 
So once again, uh, once again, uh, good afternoon, uh, dear chair, honorable members of the uh, legislative uh, assembly. At, uh, first and foremost, I really would like to thank you uh, for your uh, kind invitation to address uh, uh, your committee. Indeed, uh, for me, uh, it's uh, an honor uh, to be here, and I hope uh, that I will be also able to to meet you in uh, uh, person uh, as soon as uh, the. Uh, situation will permit that. As you uh, rightly uh, pointed out uh, over the past week, uh, I had uh, the bilateral meetings with the leaders of uh, all five parties forming the Northern Ireland Executive, and I have learned a lot uh, from these meetings. If you allow me, I will just stop here. Can you see me well? Yep. Yes, indeed. Yes, we can see and hear you perfectly. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so I was just uh, referring to my to my meetings with uh, bilateral meetings uh, with the leaders of uh, all five uh, parties forming the Northern Ireland Executive, and indeed I learned uh, a lot, and I'm sure that uh, this would continue also in the course uh, of our meeting. On top of it, I also would like to to highlight that um, uh, my team and um, myself. Uh, been uh, frequently uh, reaching out to the civil society, to the business uh, community in uh, Northern Ireland, and occasionally we did together uh, with uh, Lord Frost. And I have to say that uh, the dialogue uh, I was having with these groups had been uh, very fruitful uh, to date, uh, and uh, that we'll do our uh, utmost together with my team to continue this uh, engagement. As you said, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, agreements between the EU and UK provide us with a solid basis for the close and stable uh, partnership we would like to see to develop. Uh, and in order to reap uh, the full benefits uh, of the agreements uh, we have jointly uh, concluded, uh, the full and faithful implementation is crucial. Understandably, I uh, imagine uh, that you are most uh, interested in the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. This protocol, as I'm sure you know, was the most difficult part uh, of the entire negotiations. And it was agreed by the current UK Prime Minister and uh, by Lord Frost, who was at that time uh, the chief uh, negotiator. And uh, uh, everyone knew uh, what we were talking about. Uh, and uh, it was quite clear already at that time that Brexit would have uh, consequences uh, and uh, that changes uh, would be inevitable. And uh, after years of uh, detailed negotiations, uh, the protocol was the only possible uh, solutions we found to avoid hard border on the island of Ireland to ensure peace and stability uh, in Northern Ireland and to protect the integrity of the EU single market. The protocol explicitly states that it protects the Good Friday Agreement in all its uh, dimensions. The very first article uh, of the protocol states it has no impact whatsoever on the constitutional status of uh, Northern Ireland. It is an arrangement about trade designed to solve the serious practical problems caused uh, by Brexit itself and the kind of Brexit uh, chosen by the UK government. It is democratic and it gives a voice uh, to Northern Ireland. Every four years, uh, uh, you as a members uh, of Legislative Assembly will have the opportunity to decide whether Article 5 to 10 of the protocol continue uh, to apply through the consent mechanism. In the meetings of the Joint uh, Committee, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister speak and make the contribution. The protocol also provides for automatic dynamic uh, alignment in order to ensure that uh, UK authorities have all relevant information necessary for this uh, uh, implementation. It also establishes uh, the joint consultative uh, working group. And all relevant information is exchanged here on new acts and instruments relevant for the implementation of the protocol at uh, all the stages. Nobody has yet uh, suggested a better workable alternative. The protocol needs uh, to be fully and correctly implemented. And at the same time, our approach has been and uh, still is solution-oriented, 
constructive and uh, flexible. The protocol is a unique solution that the EU has never offered before. We are outsourcing the control of part of our border to a third country. The EU has demonstrated the pragmatism we are occasionally and uh, wrongly accused of lacking. We have spared no efforts in trying to mitigate problems uh, that have arisen in the implementation of the protocol and have explored and put on the table practical and permanent solutions. Naturally, however, there are limits uh, to what can be achieved. And I really would like to assure you that nothing we do is arbitrary. Our actions are well uh, uh, thought through. Our uh, way of working may be complex, but it is inclusive. We listen to directly elected uh, European Parliament and our member states. The regular meetings we have been having with them both uh, during the negotiations and now have resulted in our very clear and entirely reasonable mandates. And this is the uh, basis uh, on which we work. Full implementation of the protocol is our uh, fundamental uh, starting point. On that basis, we can discuss which permanent flexibilities in the implementation we can agree to. Uh, the Commission has identified uh, pathways to a good number of flexibilities in line with protocol and presented uh, the UK with papers, uh, for example, in area of uh, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, uh, measures, uh, uh, where uh, we are looking uh, for the ways how, for example, uh, to address the issue of uh, tagging of animals or assistant dogs or high-risk plants. And we heard uh, about this issue from our UK partners in the beginning of this year, and we already offered and proposed the solution. We are working with the same intensity on uh, the issues like value-added tax on second-hand cars, on uh, tariff rate quotas on steel, and uh, measures to continue the supply of medicine to the Northern Ireland, which I know it's uh, very sensitive and it's uh, also personally for me extremely important that we will uh, uh, sort out uh, this very important issue. We are willing to consider taking bold, bold steps if the UK government demonstrates a clear and concrete uh, commitment to implementing the protocol in full. The supply of medicine is a particular issue to which, as I said, uh, I am acutely sensitive. We want to ensure that citizens in uh, Northern Ireland have full uh, access to all the medicines they need. And we are ready to move uh, ahead fast. This will not be easy, uh, as this would require a change uh, of our EU rules but I am committed to do this important effort if it requires actually legislative change on our side. Ultimately, our work is about making sure that peace and stability in Northern Ireland are protected uh, at the same time uh, 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 preserving the integrity of the EU single market, including Ireland's place in it, while also having as little impact as possible on daily lives of citizens in Northern Ireland. Like you, uh, therefore, I want to see the necessary checks reduced to absolute minimum possible. To mention one measure that would address uh, some concerns and could be negotiated uh, uh, very quickly, uh, a so-called Swiss-style veterinary agreement. The UK uh, continuing to apply EU SPS rules would do away with the vast majority of the checks uh, in the Irish Sea and would not require checks um, elsewhere, say in Northern Ireland, uh, including for travels with pets, for example. The New Zealand, uh, uh, the New Zealand uh, style equivalents, for example, wouldn't do that. The Commission published uh, a table I will show it to you, and I know that you will not see it uh, that well from the, from the distance. But I can tell you that, uh, this, uh, that this green part, this is EU-style, uh, uh, Swiss-style uh, veterinary agreement. Green, it means no checks required. And here you have uh, the equivalence, uh, different types of uh, agreement, when you see how many checks still need to be performed. So even if uh, that type of... Uh, 
uh, equivalence agreement uh, put on the table will not resolve most of the uh, problems which uh, the uh, communities uh, in uh, Northern Ireland are uh, concerned about. And I have to say that in many uh, contacts with the Northern Irish uh, stakeholders, I uh, have had a positive feedback to our idea or this Swiss type veterinary agreement, which I said would alleviate most uh, checks and facilitate east west uh, trade flows between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I'm very well uh, aware of the UK's uh, government's initial concerns, but remain. Uh, optimistic that we can find a solution that would work uh, for everybody, uh, most of all for people of Northern Ireland. We can also have a temporary agreement. It was addition to my initial uh, proposal until the UK chooses to opt for different SPS standards, let's say if they are about to conclude very important uh, free trade agreement with another partner. As uh, I'm sure you are aware, on the 17th of June, we received a request uh, from the UK government to extend grace period on chilled meat. First of all, the Commission welcomes uh, the UK choosing uh, to work on this issue jointly. Some have accused uh, the Commission of not always uh, uh, acting uh, jointly. Let me repeat uh, once again what I have said many times before. The Commission, the EU, did not invoke Article 16 of the Protocol. The mere consideration of including in the text of a draft regulation a reference to the safeguard provision of the Protocol was a genuine mistake, for which the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has expressed regret and apologized in public. In any case, the events of 29th of January cannot put our determination to the full and faithful implementation of the protocol in question, and our commitment to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is unwavering. Talking repeatedly as though we had triggered Article 16 uh, irresponsibly fans the flames. Rather, we must do everything from every side to de-dramatize the rhetoric and find the solutions. Unfortunately, the unilateral measures uh, which the UK government has taken back in March this year did contradict uh, the much-needed spirit of joint action and clearly uh, violated uh, what we had agreed. As uh, you will know, the Commission launched an infringement procedure on these measures on 15th of March uh, of this year. And without uh, satisfactory steps by the UK to remedy these measures, we will have no choice but to step up those legal proceedings. So it's good that the UK is pursuing a different avenue on chilled meat. On 18th of June, the Commission issued a statement reiterating our openness to finding solutions in the line uh, with the uh, uh, protocol. We made clear for that to happen, the UK must fully implement the protocol, which is the solution found to protect the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, the functioning of the all island economy and the integrity of the EU single market. In the past few days, I have been in intensive contact with the European Parliament and EU member states on this request. As you know, we have uh, an inclusive legislative process in the EU. And while I cannot uh, today announce the EU's formal agreement to the UK government's request, after all the internal contacts I have had, I remain confident that we can find a solution within the next 48 hours that will address both sides' needs and concerns. I hope to be bringing such optimism to Northern Ireland more in the future. We have been uh, gravely concerned at the negative rhetoric about uh, the protocol, which is, after all, an instrument to protect uh, peace and stability and calls to trigger uh, safeguard measures under the protocol if it damages the political, social uh, or economic fabric of life in Northern Ireland. Let's not forget this is the impact of Brexit and the choices made by the UK government, not of the protocol nor uh, the European Union. The protocol actually limits considerably the impact of Brexit in Northern Ireland. In fact, protocol actually creates opportunities when combined with Northern Ireland's unique selling points. 
dual market access, an advanced legal system, some of the best universities in Europe, advanced telecoms infrastructure, pro-business uh, environment, competitive operating costs, and proximity to major markets make Northern Ireland a unique place to invest. These elements, when combined, provide a powerful incentive uh, to attract investment from overseas. So it is no wonder Invest and I has identified over 30 new potential inward investment opportunities since the beginning of this year. My idea of an investment conference in Northern Ireland with businesses from member states to demonstrate these advantages and opportunities has already had a positive response, both from the people I speak to in Northern Ireland and the European Union. I know that several of you have promoted these advantages and opportunities as well. And I just would like to reassure you that they are very real and can, and this cannot be said uh, often enough. In addition, we will continue to support Peace Plus uh, program with the UK and Ireland. Together with co-financing these amounts to approximately 1 billion euros for the projects in Northern Ireland. And I hope uh, I have shown that our approach is guided by pragmatism, stability and constructive uh, engagement. Support in Northern Ireland for such a pragmatic solution is welcome and contributes to de-dramatizing the delicate situation. My goal has always been and continues to be to move decisively onto a result-oriented path to permanent solutions in the interest of all communities in Northern Ireland and for peace and stability. So, Honorable Members, the Chair, thank you very much uh, for providing me with the opportunity to address you, to explain you our thinking, our approach, uh, and our, uh, our absolute commitment to people uh, of Northern Ireland, to peace, stability, and uh, prosperity of all island economy. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm ready for our debate, for your questions, for your statements. Uh, uh, or for the advice you would like uh, to give us here in the European Union. Thank you very much. Vice President Sefcovic, thank you very much for that detailed opening presentation, which has provided us with an excellent resume of where we are uh, and has given us an indication of what is still outstanding and uh, some of the journeys that will be taking place in the next few days with regard uh, to the protocol. Um, we will move now to questions and we will work our way round the room where most of the members are and we have one member that is also joining us remotely. Um, but I will begin maybe and ask, uh, I know that you referenced this, but many of us do believe and it certainly would be my position that we would want to see a Swiss style SPS system in place because it would remove many of the checks that are required at ports. Um, and that has caused a lot of concern to people. But some of the difficulty that I have is that the very people that are saying that we shouldn't have checks are objecting to us having a Swiss-style uh, deal. So could I get you again to just explain what are the virtues and what are the positives of such a Swiss-style SPS system? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, also for uh, the possibility to uh, come back to these very uh, important uh, uh, issues, because, uh, because I understand why uh, this is so pressing and uh, why it is uh, such an important issue. So maybe if you uh, give me the opportunity, I will once again show you this slide and, of course, we'll be very happy to, to, to send it to you. The, the green uh, part of it uh, is actually the uh, EU-Switzerland uh, uh, veterinary agreement. So you see there are, there are, there are no checks needed for all sorts of, uh, of goods uh, and, uh, and products. Then if you go, would go to the EU uh, or if you go to the EU-New Zealand uh, type of an agreement, you see that uh, simply quite a lot of checks still needs uh, uh, to be done. And I can tell you that the uh, difference uh, there is that uh, uh, with uh, New Zealand, what we are trading for is covered only by 11 pieces of the legislation. But of course, with the UK, because uh, 
for 47 years we've been in, uh, in, in the single market, there is more than 100 legal acts. So you can imagine that how many more checks would need to be done if you just would like uh, to go for some kind of uh, equivalence type uh, of uh, the agreement. And then you have for the last part, these are the other third countries, and you see that everything is, everything is checked. So this is, I would say, the, the very simple comparison for the, for the sake, uh, for the sake uh, of uh, the argument and for, I would say, uh, targeting better uh, my, my message. And uh, I think that uh, uh, still the advantages of such a solutions are so predominant uh, that I hope that we can engage our UK partners to discuss it. What I, what I hear... Uh, from the uh, from the UK is that they are very reserved uh, because of the dynamic alignment issue. But here, what I would say is that for 47 years we've been in a in a single market, uh, so uh, our legislation is uh, uh, still very very similar, and uh, that it shouldn't be such a, a, a big problem to to overcome uh, this uh, uh, difference. And uh, I know that uh, uh, the UK uh, government doesn't want to have their hands tied because uh, uh, there might be a big uh, uh, free trade uh, agreement coming with uh, important partners like, for example, United uh, States uh, of America. But we know that such agreements uh, take time to negotiate, uh, very often several, several years. And if in the end, there will be uh, a need uh, uh, to kind of align the, the UK um, uh, SPS rules with uh, those of US, people would understand. And we would say, okay, so in that case, uh, we'll go back uh, uh, to the checks uh, and, and controls, but this time uh, we would use the time for, for bridging over the current uh, situation. I hope uh, we can build up the infrastructure, we can hire and train personnel, uh, uh, we can get uh, finally the real-time access to the to the IT system, so the checks can be performed more smoothly, faster, and uh, they will be uh, they will be uh, no intrusive uh, at all uh, to the uh, to the people of uh, uh, Northern Ireland. So, so that's the, the position which we presented uh, to our uh, UK partners. I hope. Uh, that uh, jointly uh, we can solve the, uh, the issue of the chilled meat within 48 hours. We will have a three months uh, uh, to have another try, another attempt uh, how to solve this issue. I can just tell you that we are approaching this with open mind and that we have kind of ready-made recipe how we can sort it out at least 80% of the, of the checks uh, and controls uh, which are otherwise required uh, by the protocol. So I hope uh, that also with, uh, with, uh, with your help, uh, we can find the good solutions to this uh, very important issue. Well, th thank you very much for that. Now, that seems a very reasonable uh, perspective of, of twofold. Number one, there's the option of the Swiss style agreement, but then there's also the option in the short term to use that. Uh, and I suppose that if people uh, disagree with checks, uh, and do not want to see those checks, this is an opportunity uh, to be able to provide a way where they won't have to have those checks. It's about providing a solution and, and is very uh, welcome. If I could ask, um, you made reference as well to, to the fact that there are positives uh, for uh, the North, for Northern Ireland, in terms of its location of having the dual market access. Um, can I ask, you know, you made reference to the investment conference. Is that something that the EU would be able to assist and help with? Because I certainly believe that we uh, are going to be in a, a place where many businesses would like to come and establish themselves. And from that would come jobs, employment and prosperity. Uh, but we will have to, a job of work to do to sell that. Is that something that the EU would be prepared uh, to, help, to help us with? Absolutely, Honourable Chair, because uh, I think that uh, uh, we need to, uh, to go in that direction. And to be quite honest, I was kind of hoping that uh, um, uh, this summer we will be already planning this conference that uh, we've been kind of guiding 
the, the trade the delegations and investors from the EU coming uh, to Northern Ireland because uh, Northern Ireland is very unique. I was just making reference to your uh, fantastic universities, strong uh, uh, telecom sectors, uh, excellent uh, workforce and many other uh, elements uh, which are so important uh, for the investors. But on top of it, uh, you are only place uh, in the world where uh, you are operating on two very important markets uh, at the same time. The biggest uh, trading bloc, uh, which is the EU, on a very important market of the UK. And what I have to say, it's cost free. So nor like uh, Norway, for example, you, uh, nobody, uh, you don't have to pay for access to this biggest uh, uh, trading bloc. On top of it, uh, for the access of goods from Northern Ireland to the EU uh, single market, there are no uh, import duties uh, due for the companies involved. There are no custom uh, formalities uh, uh, which otherwise would be applicable. There is no regulatory uh, compliance checks uh, or controls uh, needed. And uh, then uh, you have the all issues which relate to other customs formalities, VATs, and so on and so forth. So actually, it's a huge advantage uh, um, uh, to have uh, uh, the access uh, to, the, to the single market and at the same time, unfettered access uh, uh, to the uh, UK internal market. And I think, and we already start to see that, uh, that the distribution hub, uh, commercial centers would be uh, more and more located in Northern Ireland just to benefit from all that elements uh, which I mentioned. And I sincerely hope that it will uh, bring uh, new growth. Uh, it will bring new, new jobs, new investment opportunities to Northern Ireland. And when I discuss it uh, uh, with uh, business leaders, be it uh, from Northern Ireland and from Europe, they agree with me on everything what I have said. They just, of course, are highlighting also one very important fact that uh, for all this to, to, to materialize, uh, we need uh, the political stability, we need legal certainty, and we need predictability, which is, I think, the case for all investors all over the world when they decide to make uh, important uh, investment. And I think it should be our joint uh, task uh, uh, to add these three very important elements. Uh, and I hope uh, and we will be ready to engage uh, with, with you and with your business community to organize such an investors conference uh, uh, already in autumn uh, of, the, of the next year, because I know there is an interest. There is a very concrete uh, pipeline of projects, which was uh, uh, done uh, and performed uh, by the Invest uh, and I, and I think that would be excellent topic uh, for the discussion. Okay, and look, f thank you for that. And fi finally, from myself, just um, you know the, that there does actually remain, as a result of Brexit, a service border on on the island of Ireland um, because the protocol is dealing with with trade and with goods, and this kind of can debunk somewhat the argument that the only border uh, is down the Irish Sea. Um, could you give us your views on what future there is for the service industry on the island of Ireland as a result of Brexit? And is there anything that the EU could do to help, uh, given that we're going to face that service border on the island of Ireland? I think that, um, uh, of course, uh, with uh, coming uh, investments and with uh, creation, let's say, of uh, distribution uh, hubs or, uh, or logistical uh, centres, of course, uh, uh, what, what it comes together with is also a lot of uh, services, a lot of people who have to make sure that uh, all these uh, new opportunities are properly, properly used, uh, evolve and, and uh, develop. So I would be also very optimistic for the uh, service uh, industry in uh, uh, Northern Ireland. And I think that the best uh, uh, response uh, to, uh, I would say, this uh, question is when you discuss concrete projects. As you know, I was uh, involved before that uh, with the uh, Energy Union. Now I work uh, on the European Battery Alliance. And of course, you can have, uh, and it's important to have them, a lot of uh, the theoretical discussion, a lot of uh, debates about the legal uh, framework, about the investment opportunities. But what really focuses the mind is when you are talking about concrete projects, okay, where it will be. 
uh, what kind of type of business, what is the level of investment, how many people you are going to employ, what would be the additional businesses which could be created based on that big investment. And I think uh, that's uh, what uh, put everything into perspective uh, and uh, kind of uh, focus the minds of the business leaders, also of political leaders, because you always have to create appropriate uh, economic, uh, legal and uh, political uh, conducive environment for such an investment uh, to happen. And therefore, I think that it would be good uh, to have this as one of the discussions which we can uh, discuss in the framework of the investment uh, conference in the autumn of this year. Okay, uh, Vice President, thank you very much. I'm going to pass you on to my colleague and Deputy Chair, uh, John Stewart. John? Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Seskowitz, thank you very much again for taking the time to engage with us today. I think it is really important. I also want to thank you for engaging with my party leader, Doug Beattie, who I know you met with last week, and we do thank you for taking that time. Um, on the back of that meeting, it will come as no surprise that my party and I fundamentally oppose the protocol. We didn't back Brexit, but we certainly do not back um, the outcomes of the protocol and what it brings. It is my firm belief that its rigorous implementation damages Northern Ireland, creates a democratic deficit, negatively impacts trade with our biggest market, and is having um, damage and impact on the delicate balance of political relations here. Unfortunately for all the engagement from yourself, sir, and from the EU, it does feel that these concerns are not being heard, and, as it, and as particularly among the unionist community. There are genuine, powerful, legitimate concerns about the impact of the protocol. And I'm just keen to, to get from yourself as a first question. Can you demonstrate how you are hearing these, how these, the EU Commission are actually listening to the concerns among the unionist community in Northern Ireland and what you're doing to show that these are being heard? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, and I very much appreciate uh, uh, the discussion with, you, with your leader, with uh, Mr. Beatty, and I think that we had very, very open-minded and and, uh, and sincere uh, discussion. So if you allow me, you know, the, the first, which is, I think, very important uh, to, to highlight again, I think that the first article uh, in, in the protocol is uh, about uh, our uh, full uh, respect uh, of uh, constitutional uh, arrangements of the UK. Uh, it's uh, very clearly that not only through this uh, protocol, but also uh, through our very concrete step over the course of the uh, uh, last 20 uh, plus year, we demonstrated through our peace program that, that we are your friend. That we've been always on in, in, in your side and we uh, only acted uh, when uh, you requested us to, to act. And uh, therefore for us, peace, stability, uh, no hard border are absolute uh, fundamental principles uh, which we've been respecting throughout the negotiations and which are paramount uh, for us uh, uh, also today. And if it comes uh, uh, to the if it comes to the uh, to the issue of uh, democratic uh, deficit, as you know, our negotiating uh, partner is uh, United uh, Kingdom, and we have to respect that because we, as I said, uh, are respecting uh, the, the constitutional uh, uh, arrangement of the UK. But I have to underline here, I'm now talking to you. I am uh, I'm, I'm ready uh, uh, to be uh, your partner, your, your guest. I'm ready to engage uh, with you when you feel this would be appropriate. Uh, I also know that the European Parliament is very much looking forward to uh, to establish uh, this uh, special partnership uh, between uh, the e uh, EU and uh, uh, UK Parliament, and I know that there is a strong interest in having special uh, Northern Ireland uh, subcommittee, which of course would be again very much welcomed uh, by the EU side. But it's up to UK to decide uh, how we would uh, let's say uh, craft. Uh, uh, the, the, the structure for our parliamentary uh, dimension work. And the last thing which I also would like to highlight is uh, the formation of the joint uh, consultative working group where uh, we already had, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at least uh, three mistakes, uh, three, uh, three meetings where we want to uh, inform you in advance uh, and also one on ongoing files, what is being prepared, what is being discussed, uh, uh, what kind of new legis legislation is in a pipeline. So uh, you will be uh, properly informed and uh, you will be properly engaged. 
So I think that if uh, you will come up with additional ways how we can improve uh, our collaboration, which would of course uh, uh, re respect uh, the constitutional arrangement of the UK, we are ready to engage. I know that uh, members of the European Parliament would love to have uh, uh, also uh, 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 contacts uh, uh, with you and uh, uh, we will be ready to look at uh, all issues you put on the table because it's our strong uh, conviction, conviction that uh, uh, the protocol, after really looking at it from, for four years from all the angles, is uh, only a viable solution to protect peace, to, uh, to protect stability and avoiding hard border on the island of Ireland. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, your argument, Dr. Shesovich, that the protocol protects the Good Friday Agreement, I simply, simply cannot accept. I'm very proud of the Good Friday Agreement. I'm very proud in the role the Ulster Unionist Party played in that. Myself, my party, architects of that agreement, are all believe that the protocol damages the Good Friday Agreements. As recently as last month, the Fianna Fáil chair of the Irish Senate Special Committee on the Withdrawal of the UK from the EU, Lisa Chambers, said exactly the same thing when questioned by my party leader. So how can you argue that it upholds and protects the Good Friday Agreement when so many people are arguing that it actually drives a horse and cart through the middle of it, given that it is putting a border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom? Yes, I think that what I have to say here, it's uh, uh, the, very clearly once again uh, to highlight our, our position uh, that, uh, uh, and it's uh, also in uh, the articles of uh, the protocol itself, which says that it protects the Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all its dimensions. This was uh, clearly um, our, our position. We entered into these negotiations and uh, with which uh, um, very high on our mind, we've been uh, uh, negotiating uh, the, the whole protocol. And uh, I understand that was clearly the opinion of our UK partners who uh, negotiated uh, not only the withdrawal agreement, and uh, trade and cooperation agreement, but also protocol line by line. And uh, we uh, clearly uh, concluded uh, that this is uh, uh, definitely, uh, that this is uh, definitely uh, the, the best uh, way uh, forward. And therefore I think it was uh, uh, not only approved by the uh, British uh, prime minister, but uh, overwhelmingly uh, supported uh, in um, the UK uh, Parliament. And this is how we also see the uh, ratification and agreement which was done, uh, as I said, uh, by the UK. Uh, what I would add uh, is um, making sure that uh, there is nothing in uh, the, the protocol uh, which uh, uh, prevents uh, the United Kingdom from ensuring unfettered uh, market access for goods uh, uh, moving from Northern Ireland to the rest of the United uh, Kingdom market. And uh, as the uh, UK government, I can say, uh, has prioritized its uh, right to diverge from uh, EU standards, some controls are uh, unavoidable, just to make sure that the goods entering the Northern Ireland and therefore the single markets don't fall below the agreed uh, standards. And this uh, reality has been clear from very uh, start and it, and it is what the UK government explicitly negotiated, uh, signed up to and uh, enshrined in the treaty as, as part of international law. So there is, uh, I would say, and I think we also have to bear in mind a direct uh, link between the level of uh, checks uh, required and the UK's uh, policy on, either, on uh, divergence. So therefore I'm coming back uh, to the proposal I made reference to several times already this afternoon, and this is this SPS uh, agreement because it would um, uh, indeed uh, uh, resolve, as I said, 80% uh, of the problem uh, which we are also discussing today. Okay. Okay. Um, if I could move to an online contribution from Martina Anderson, who's uh, joining us remotely today. Martina, can I pass to yourself? Uh, thank you, Chair and Vice President Sefcic. Thank you as well. I am joining remotely just to avoid having too many members in the room. Can I say go in my August? Thank you for this exchange of views. Uh, it is unusual for an EU commissioner who is only accountable to the European Parliament to appear in front of a regional assembly, let alone a committee, 
of a regional assembly. And as a former MEP, I appreciate your engagement. I will only make one comment and one question because I know all our members are keen to get in, but it has been said in the committee, but it does need to be repeated to avoid doubt and ensure certainty. The majority of the people in the North of Ireland opposed Brexit. And reflecting that position, the majority in this assembly has repeatedly supported the protocol as necessary to mitigate some of the worst impacts of Brexit on the island of Ireland. So, Commissioner, would you agree that to protect the All Ireland uh, economy, to protect Ireland to the, the Good Friday Agreement, that the protocol was an inevitable consequence of what the majority of us view as an unmitigated disaster of Brexit? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. And I very much like the, the sign uh, behind you, no coffee, no worky. That's <laughs> something how, how I conduct myself in the office as well. But uh, coming, coming back uh, to your very, very important, uh, very important uh, question. To be, I would say, very, very open about it, I think that uh, the negotiations on uh, on on the protocol have been the, the hardest part of uh, all the discussions uh, and, and uh, negotiations we had uh, uh, with the UK. Because what we've been indeed trying to do was to, 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 to square the circle, if I can use that expression. And and the result of it was, uh, uh, from uh, my perspective, uh, I would say, unparalleled leap of trust confidence and enormous effort uh, to make uh, things work because uh, you cannot find it anywhere uh, anywhere else in the world that we actually ask uh, the UK authorities in this case uh, uh, northern irish uh, uh, authorities to perform the, uh, the the checks on 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 goods coming to northern ireland what i want to use also this opportunity for is uh, to thank wholeheartedly the professionals uh, who are working uh, on this uh, uh, border uh, um, crossing points because uh, they developed a uh, very good, very professional relationship uh, with that uh, very minuscule uh, group uh, of our experts who are working with them, uh, who are advising them uh, how to do uh, things better. And we very much, very much uh, appreciate that. And uh, therefore, we went uh, for such a extent because we are so aware of uh, the sensible um, and delicate uh, situation in Northern Ireland. We know uh, what kind of delicate uh, balance the, the leaders of uh, uh, Northern Ireland managed to find when uh, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement was signed. I was at that time working in uh, national capacity for for my country for Slovakia. I was diplomat and and I was I was really following it very closely because I I knew that what I was looking at uh, the TV screen that that's the history in making history of making to get over the years of troubles uh, the enormous compromises and 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 true leadership uh, uh, clearly demonstrated by by all uh, leaders involved and I think now it requires the same we have to face uh, the inevitable uh, consequences of, of, of Brexit. I think the first part was done. We found uh, uh, the, the best possible solution, withdrawal agreement, TCA protocol, and now we have to uh, uh, fully implement it in a way uh, which again would underline that uh, constructiveness, uh, that uh, I would say ingenuity in, in looking for the solutions which are good uh, for people uh, of uh, Northern Ireland, which would allow us uh, to continue to have no hard border uh, between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and which would bring the prosperity, new jobs and new investment uh, in, uh, uh, in Northern Ireland. That was the idea. That was our, our goal. And uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to, to demonstrate it by the, by the concrete actions, which I said. As you know, the first half of our relationship with the UK was uh, not an easy one. 
Uh, we've been uh, extremely surprised by unilateral unilateral actions uh, uh, coming from London. But despite that fact, we've been working flat out to find a solution for assistance dogs, to find a solution. And we even have to change the legislation. It means that all member states and all the European Parliament has to agree for that, for the medicines. We are looking for the solution for the uh, 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 tariffs and quotas uh, for steel for VAT on secondary cars, for tagging of the animals, uh, for scrapies for the ships, and I can continue and go on and on and on. So I, I just hope that uh, you will take it uh, for the face value that what we do is really genuine. We want to find uh, the solution, and I think that uh, uh, solutions are reachable. They are, they are, they are, they are possible, uh, and uh, our goal uh, is only one, uh, to have the prosperity on the island of Ireland, to bring uh, the new opportunities for the people in uh, Northern Ireland and to avoid the hard border and, of course, protect uh, uh, the integrity of our single market. Because why these controls are so important? Because we are talking about uh, public health, we are talking about animal, uh, animal health, and I think that... Uh, that you in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, you uh, know it uh, very well because uh, uh, it was uh, already uh, the situation uh, uh, before, which is uh, in there right now, that if it comes uh, to, for example, phytosanitary, uh, phytosanitary controls, there have always been uh, these uh, checks. It was always the, the, the feature of goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland due to the fact that the island of Ireland is a single epidemiological unit. And I remember very well the famous uh, statement uh, of uh, Reverend uh, Ian Paisley who said that, you know, how can you distinguish uh, uh, if the cows are from, uh, from north or south? They are Irish cows. So this is what we want to do in, in practice in the, in the form of protocol, and, and, and I hope that we will be able to, to achieve that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair, okay. you, Vice President. Okay, thank you. And I suppose, uh, Vice President, some of the um, SPS checks and the protocol need to be there for the free flow of coffee, which is something else that we're all agreeing on at today's meeting, which is very important. Uh, I'm going to pass now to uh, Diane Dodds for some questioning. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President, um, for uh, taking the time to engage with us today. I think it is hugely, hugely uh, important that you hear uh, from the members of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, you have, um, I have a number of questions that I would uh, like uh, to uh, seek some um, answers from you today. But first of all, maybe just a statement. And you talk about article, uh, the first article. Um, under uh, the new arrangements with the United Kingdom and that these do not undermine the constitutional uh, impact on Northern Ireland. It is actually quite staggering that in a recent court case um, on the impact of the protocol that our own government actually uh, argued that uh, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol impliedly repealed Article 6 of the Act of Union. So the constitutional impact is very real and is very worrying. However, the, the element of this that I do want to um, really focus on and I would like uh, your um, views on is that uh, element of consent. You repeatedly, and indeed in my many years in the European Parliament, I've heard it um, repeated many times uh, that the Commission, the Parliament are all united in your support for the Belfast Agreement. And indeed, you even include it in all of its parts uh, within the text. However, that agreement also includes the principle of consent. And stability in Northern Ireland is best secured when we have consent from all of its people. And here in the Northern Ireland Assembly, that consent means that on these huge issues, consent should be drawn from both communities. Vice President, you must realise that today you are at an assembly in Northern Ireland where no representative, not one, from the unionist community gives consent to the Northern Ireland Protocol. That is a very, very serious position for us to be in, 
and I think it's one that Europe should take seriously. And I want you to explain to people here in Northern Ireland why you do not um, look for consent from the unionist community, why you persist in ignoring the unionist community. Is it because we're not important? Is it driven by Dublin? But it is time that so we I, have... I, I, do, no, I, don't, I, don't, I think we need questions. I appreciate yeah. you have a number of questions there that maybe he might want to answer. This, but um, it um, is time that we have a, a, an issue that yeah. is actually dominated uh, by the consent of both um, communities here. Can I turn very quickly also to the issue around uh, trade and trade flows from Great Britain to Northern Ireland? You know... Uh, very well, that these are vastly more important than any other trading relationship that we have. Yet this Northern Ireland Protocol adds complexity and cost. I'll quote you two figures. At a House of Lords committee recently, Marks and Spencers indicated that the Northern Ireland Protocol would add £30 million to their cost of doing business with Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. A haulage firm indicated that um, the Northern Ireland Protocol would add uh, between 50 and 350 pounds per pallet um, to their cost of bringing goods from GB to Northern Ireland. It's hugely detrimental, and we need complete and permanent solutions. And I know in good faith you're trying to get us to October, but that is not the way to do business for businesses in Northern Ireland. And I'd like to know how you intend um, to um, actually get some complete and permanent solutions that are acceptable um, for Northern Ireland. Can I also just um, uh, reference... Diane, sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to call you now. There's about nine questions there. That's We've okay. got two minutes left. We've six members that need to speak, and you've used most That's of your right. five minutes Thank so you. far. So maybe if the Vice President could answer the questions thus far, and then we can move to another member. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I very much appreciate also the, the sincerity and, uh, and openness in the remarks of uh, uh, Madame uh, uh, Diane, Diane Dodds. I mean, on, on the very first uh, remark uh, uh, she made about uh, the constitutional order or arrangement of the, of the, of the UK, I think it's uh, not only me, but also Lord Frost stated it very, very clearly. Um, uh, in uh, Westminster that uh, the protocol in no way violates uh, uh, the, the constitutional order of the, of the UK. And here I have to say uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, we are in a complete agreement uh, uh, on that. And uh, I can also assure you that we have no interest in interfering into the domestic policies or internal uh, debate. And we have uh, absolute respect uh, for all communities uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. Therefore, we went uh, to such a length to find uh, the, 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 uh, the accommodation of uh, different interests, which I already described uh, uh, several times uh, uh, this uh, uh, afternoon. And we take very seriously uh, your, your concerns and uh, the point you put uh, on the table. Uh, you know uh, very well that uh, Northern Irish Assembly uh, would clearly have a say uh, in 2024 uh, if to continue uh, with the protocol or not. And in the meantime, as I said, uh, of course, I cannot speak uh, and I, on behalf uh, of the UK, but from, from the side of the EU, I can tell you that there is uh, absolutely extended hand to have these exchanges with uh, North Irish Assembly to really use the joint consultative uh, group uh, for very intense uh, meetings and discussions where we can really inform uh, you what is planning, what is happening, and also listen uh, to, uh, to your concerns. And as I said to you as a, a former member of the European Parliament, I'm sure that you have a lot of contacts uh, in uh, Strasbourg and, and Brussels, and, uh, uh, and I know that it will not be a surprise to you that many of your former colleagues would just love to have more intense direct contacts 
be it in the form of parliamentary assembly or special subcommittee uh, for uh, for Northern Ireland. So all this we would like to do, and hopefully this uh, communication would help us to, to clarify many of the issues we are discussing today. If it comes to uh, to the Mark uh, Spencer uh, issue, I understand that it's that it's uh, uh, Mark uh, Spencer. I know that you have also different. Uh, chains uh, were, uh, which are not so worried uh, uh, about uh, uh, the current situation because they already uh, invested in making sure that they have a uh, distribution hubs and, uh, and centers in uh, uh, Northern Ireland. But uh, also uh, to take uh, uh, on board what you have mentioned about uh, Mark and Spencer, uh, we've been working with uh, Lord Frost's predecessor uh, Michael Go on a trusted trader scheme. And uh, I think that we've been very generous in how this uh, uh, scheme would be, uh, uh, would be applied uh, in uh, the UK. Uh, we still wait for more concrete uh, data uh, coming from our UK partners for, uh, so we can, uh, we can uh, assess it. And I think we demonstrated a lot of flexibility to make sure that uh, the uh, shelves in uh, Northern Irish uh, supermarkets are uh, well, uh, well supplied. And the last point, uh, which I, I'm sorry that I am repeating myself, the, the solution to this would be this uh, SPS agreement, because then I said, you have no problem with the, with the mincemeat, with the chilled meat, with the, with the sausages, with checking of animals, the pets. And I think it's such an obvious uh, choice that uh, I hope that we can, we can um, find a way forward on this very important issue uh, with uh, Lord Frost and, uh, uh, and in between our teams. Thank you very much for that response there. I'm going to pass to Trevor uh, Lund for a question. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Sexsovich, for talking to us today. It's much appreciated. You, you, you've mentioned several times today the question around steel tariffs and uh, VAT on second-hand cars. Now, back in, in January, Michael Gove assured us, he was quite unequivocal about it, that this uh, problem had been solved. And yet it quite clearly hasn't been solved. Now, we have a very vibrant steel industry here and a considerable trade in second-hand English cars. So can you update us on that? Is there any sign of movement or uh, agreement on it? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, also for, for uh, your, your question. Concerning the uh, TRQ uh, on steel, I think it's very important for you to know that we have prepared amendments uh, uh, to our legislation to address the initial uh, request from the UK government that the steel products imported from the Great Britain into uh, Northern Ireland should be covered by EU uh, quotas. And the, the, but after that, I have to say that the UK request then expanded to the steel from the, from the rest of the world, imported into uh, Northern Ireland and to other goods such as, for example, lamb, to end up with a request that covers all uh, goods subject to quotas in, in particular agricultural goods. So we are really open to find solution to all this uh, UK request by the UK government uh, uh, should understand that uh, the scope of the request has to be stable uh, before it can be solved. So we really need to know uh, what uh, uh, we are uh, what we are looking at, and I'm sure that. Uh, uh, because you you know uh, uh, so much about steel industry, you would you would understand that they have no problem whatsoever uh, uh, in trade uh, and uh, movements of the steel between uh, uh, GB and Northern Ireland. But of course, uh, you would understand that we have to be quite vigilant uh, if it comes uh, uh, to the steel coming from the rest of the world. Uh, especially from uh, the destination against which uh, we had uh, to introduce, uh, let's say, different dumping, uh, uh, anti-dumping measures and so on and so forth. So again here, uh, I think it's a very concrete example. We are working on it, but uh, more we progress, more the things come to the table. So we need to know what is the, the scope of all the issues we, we have to resolve. And I'm sure that we will find uh, uh, the good solution for uh, Northern Ireland uh, for GB and for the EU as well, and maybe one more one more sentence on VAT of uh, second-hand uh, cars. 
This is again very um, like complex uh, technical issue. And here we are, of course, uh, looking uh, for the solution. We should make sure that uh, people in Northern Ireland uh, would not pay more uh, for purchase of uh, secondary vehicles. And at the same time that we would uh, uh, um, uh, in no way uh, undermine uh, uh, the, the market uh, in Ireland or uh, the, the rest of the single market. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I, I appreciate Dr. Sefcovic that we've kind of exceeded time, but we have just a few more members that would just have one question each. Would you be happy enough for us to continue? Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. That is really appreciated. I'm going to pass now to Pat Sheehan. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shevchevich. Uh, I'm uh, representing Sinn Féin. And I think it's important to emphasise and re-emphasise the positives in the protocol. And, and first of all, as has already been stated, the majority of representatives in this assembly support the protocol that has opened up uh, significant uh, opportunities, business opportunities for us and our economy. And you referenced yourself in your opening contribution that Invest NI has advised recently that 30 uh, investors are considering investing here in the north of Ireland. So would you agree that the protocol has opened up unique uh, and significant business opportunities in terms of our access to both the British and the European markets? Thank you. Sure, would you like me would you like me to answer or should I wait for other questions as well? Uh, if you could answer, that would be appreciated. Okay, so I think on, on this one I can be indeed uh, very brief to the arguments which I already referred to in my uh, previous uh, uh, remarks. I just would add one, I think, very, very important element. That the fact that uh, Northern Ireland would be in this unique situation, having this ample access uh, to the uh, both uh, uh, markets of the UK and the EU, this we should not forget is access to 500 million potential customers with uh, what might be the biggest purchasing power in the world. So these are uh, the, the two markets uh, uh, which have no, no, no uh, comparative parallel in the uh, in the world, not only the 500 million, but uh, the, the strength of uh, the purchasing power. The, the fact that, uh, as you know, EU is in most, uh, most cases or number one or number two trading partner for, for all economies, so that uh, we are uh, definitely uh, the number one or number two in all markets if it comes for foreign direct in, in investment. And the same applies to the destination. So I think it's a, a huge advantage uh, that Northern Ireland has access to both markets cost-free, which I think offers unique opportunities for different uh, uh, business uh, models, for distribution hubs, and uh, uh, for all that uh, uh, projects uh, for the investment, uh, which been already gathered up uh, in the pipeline of projects uh, by uh, Invest uh, Northern Ireland. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pass now to George Robinson that is indicated for a question. George. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> And uh, th thank the Vice President for coming before us here, here today. I have heard from the EU Commission time and time again that the protocol was necessary to protect the 1998 Belfast Agreement and to, to provide stability in Northern Ireland. The protocol, protocol has clearly failed to do so on all counts. Neither the UK Government, the EU or the Irish Government have upheld the principle of consent or ensured party of esteem throughout the process resulting <coughs> in the unionist community which I belong to being completely ignored and tension escalating day by day in recent months. Can, can I ask um, the Vice President what, what is the EU Commission doing to rectify this worrying situation in Northern Ireland and in my, my humble opinion Mr Vice President with respect you do not need any more honey words the bottom line is that the protocol itself needs scrapped in its present form, which drives a wedge between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
sorry also for the clarity of uh, of uh, your words and I think that also um, my presence in our discussion is I think the clear demonstration that uh, we are and we want uh, listen uh, to you and uh, uh, for the reasons uh, uh, you mentioned that we are doing everything possible uh, to show that uh, we are looking for the for the solutions uh, which would minimize uh, uh, the uh, the direct uh, consequences of, of Brexit for the people of uh, uh, Northern Ireland. And I was mentioning several times today different kind of uh, flexibilities uh, we are currently uh, uh, working on. And also, you made one point uh, where I agree that I mean to uh, to make uh, uh, the the protocol success. Uh, that we need uh, to work very jointly, UK, EU, Ireland, uh, uh, communities and parties uh, in Northern Ireland, and to and to find concrete answers uh, to very concrete questions, which I fully recognise that are legitimate. But I'm absolutely convinced that we can do it only if we would work together, if we would be really uh, looking at what could be constructive approach uh, uh, to the problem, what could be, what could be the, the, the solution, because uh, I, I was listening very carefully to everyone and I haven't heard what could be the better solution or better alternative uh, to, the, to the protocol. So I understand that we have a difference of uh, political opinion on this, but I'm absolutely sure that we, uh, we fully agree on uh, the necessity to find uh, the best, po best possible solution uh, for the people of uh, Northern Ireland who want to live in peace, in prosperity, who do not want to have a hard border uh, between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and I'm sure who would appreciate if they can profit uh, and benefit uh, from this unparalleled access to the single market and internal market uh, of the UK. Okay, thank you very much for that, Vice President. We're going to pass now for a question from Emma. Emma. Thank you, Vice President, for, for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, we, we know already Europe have told us um, that in the context of a united Ireland, the north of Ireland would assimilate back into the EU, a commitment which I obviously welcome and think would be a, a pragmatic approach. I wondered if I could ask you what you um, foresee in terms of the, the north's unique relationship with the EU as we go forward. I think that uh, if it comes uh, to the, this unique uh, relationship, as you very nicely put it, I think there are uh, several features uh, uh, which you cannot find anywhere, uh, anywhere else uh, in, in the world. I think that uh, uh, if it comes uh, to the EU and the UK, we forever will be neighbours, we, we will be allies, we share the same uh, 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 values. Uh, until now, we share most of that uh, legislation which we are discussing today because the UK was part of the single market for, for uh, 47 years. And uh, uh, Northern Ireland uh, will uh, continue to benefit uh, from what is actually the what is actually uh, 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 biggest uh, uh, single market in uh, uh, in uh, in the world. Uh, and at the same time enjoy uh, all the uh, unfettered access uh, to the rest of the UK, to the, to the GB. So I think that uh, uh, combine it with your excellent uh, universities and very well educated workforce, all these are uh, ingredients for um, uh, something which can really turn uh, uh, the, the protocol into the economic uh, success uh, to the benefit of the people of uh, Northern Ireland. Thank you. Hey, th thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to pass now to Christopher Stalford for a question. Please, Christopher. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, several times, Dr Sefcovic, you have said that you're here to listen. Please listen to me. We do not, will not, have not, and never will consent to the provisions of the protocol. It has been imposed upon our head, perhaps in dalliance with the government at Westminster. But let me assure you, not a single Unionist representative in this place endorses the provision of the protocol. In relation to the issue of the checks that are being carried out, it's obviously just less than a year 
since the arrangements have been put in place. So there can't have been that much divergence from standards. That being the case, then, why the over uh, the overhand or the rigorous and aggressive regime of checks that has been put in place? Several times during your contribution, you made reference to an SPS agreement. Is it possible that this checks regime is an untrammelled exercise in power to try and strong arm the United Kingdom into signing up to such an arrangement? Thank you very much, Chair, also for your very, very clear position. And, and uh, it's a part of uh, uh, democratic discussions you have uh, uh, in uh, uh, Northern Ireland, the discussion which is taking place in, uh, in the UK, and, and which I fully uh, appreciate uh, also uh, through your very clear messages sent uh, to us. And I uh, can tell you that I recognize that. I, I listen with uh, care to what, uh, what you say. But I cannot, under no uh, circumstances, accept the fact that uh, we are trying to use uh, Northern Ireland uh, to punish UK. Sure. That's not true, sir. I can, I can absolutely assure, assure you of that. We, as you know, uh, uh, been uh, having very hard negotiations uh, uh, with, the, with the UK, and it was not because we wanted uh, to punish the UK. It was because the choice the, the, the UK government uh, have uh, decided upon. The UK government decided to leave uh, Customs Union. They decided to leave uh, uh, SPS area. Uh, they decided to leave the, the, the single market. Uh, uh, we couldn't agree on, um, uh, on what role, uh, uh, if any, and uh, then the decision was that none should be played by the uh, European um, uh, Court of Justice. And therefore, the parameters uh, of uh, the Brexit uh, design in London have been actually uh, very tough, uh, very difficult uh, uh, to accommodate uh, with uh, what we projected uh, from the beginning is important uh, for people of Northern Ireland. And that's peace, the that protection of Good Friday Agreement in all its uh, dimension, and hopefully the future prosperity from, from the opportunity that Northern Ireland is operating on the, on, on the both market. Therefore, the, the negotiations have been, uh, been taking so long, because we've been looking for uh, that uh, solution, which uh, in the end was indeed uh, squaring the, 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 the circle. And, and we did it with open heart, with the best uh, possible intention. And that's the position we have, uh, uh, I would like to assure you, until now. And, and therefore, we are looking for all the flexibilities, for all the uh, most possible creative solutions to the, to the problems which have been uh, created uh, by, by Brexit, and uh, we will uh, continue to do so. And, uh, and I hope you would agree with me that all that elements uh, uh, of uh, flexibilities which I just listed uh, in our discussion this afternoon just demonstrate that we are working pretty hard and we are, we are trying uh, we are trying to do our utmost uh, to be constructive and a good partner uh, for Northern Ireland, as we have been over the last uh, uh, 20 plus years. Thank, thank you for that, um, Vice President. Maybe just to conclude, uh, as we're moving towards the end, um, there have been, I suppose, some concerns raised within uh, the unionist community and others about the future decision making that may be taken that will impact us directly here in Northern Ireland, but to which we may not have uh, a direct input into the decision making. C could you give me your um, understanding and, and maybe some of your thoughts around how elements such as um, Strand 2 of the Good Friday Agreement were paragraph 17 and also article 14b of the protocol which allows for that uh, discussion amongst various uh, strands here such as the north south ministerial council to be able to raise issues that are of concern and to make sure that they are addressed uh, by yourselves just to, to give me maybe your understanding of that and what weight would be placed on the remarks and the decisions that would come from those forums Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that question as well, because I think it's uh, very important and you rightly pointed out that it was uh, raised in several interventions of the esteem, uh, esteemed to honourable uh, uh, members. Uh, and uh, the first thing what I would uh, underline is uh, 
the importance of uh, the parliamentary dimension uh, of our uh, discussions. And I know uh, that uh, both uh, EU and uh, UK parliaments uh, are working hard on uh, uh, setting up uh, uh, appropriate uh, parliamentary assembly. And as I said, uh, uh, definitely on the side of the uh, European uh, Parliament, there is strong interest in having a, 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 a special uh, subcommittee or a, a, spe a special um, uh, special way how how uh, this uh, direct contacts uh, could be maintained between North Irish uh, Assembly and uh, the members uh, of the uh, European uh, Parliament. Uh, on, on top of it, uh, as you know, uh, the European Union has a well-established practice of open and uh, wide uh, uh, consultations on our uh, legislation, even before we propose it. It's uh, one of my responsibilities. It's called, I would say, in the EU speak, better regulation. And I can tell you that uh, if it comes to uh, consultations on uh, legislative proposals, that uh, the OECD ranks EU as the number one in the world. And of course, uh, any inputs, uh, any uh, uh, positions uh, in uh, uh, these consultations uh, uh, will be carefully studied, uh, uh, will be processed, and you will get uh, the response uh, uh, from us, uh, uh, what we think, uh, what can be taken on board, what is problematic, uh, where the whole process is heading. And also I think that the fact that uh, we are having uh, this discussion, which is indeed uh, very detailed, and at the same time, a very political is just uh, a clear proof that we are ready uh, to listen uh, to the to the views of uh, uh, North Irish uh, society, uh, to North Irish uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, assembly, and uh, of course, uh, and this is more, I would say, the uh, the. Uh, UK uh, uh, cuisine. I think that uh, if it comes uh, to Northern Ireland uh, uh, Assembly, I'm sure that you will scrutinize within um, your uh, competencies under the Act of uh, Devolution, uh, whatever the, the, the policy or legislation uh, you like. And we, of course, would be very much interested, and please do communicate any results of uh, uh, these uh, deliberations uh, to myself or to the UK service which we established uh, within the Commission. And uh, we'll be, of course, very much interested in continuing uh, this discussion, not only on our political level, but also on a uh, level of uh, our experts, because this uh, always uh, helps to find us uh, the best possible solutions uh, forward. Well, th thank you very much for that. And I suppose maybe just the final thing for me to do is maybe uh, just to say that we maybe could take an opportunity to meet with you again at some time later in the year, uh, just to see how matters have progressed and if there are any new viewpoints or new updates. And I, I hope maybe that that would be OK to seek that commitment to meet you later in the year, if that was OK. Absolutely. Thank you very much uh, once again for uh, this uh, very open, honest, but at the same time, uh, what I found very, very constructive uh, discussion. I, uh, I fully respect that you are representing your, your, your citizen, and therefore I also appreciate uh, the valuable time you devoted uh, to our uh, today's discussion. Uh, in the meantime, as you know, we are working uh, uh, very hard uh, with Lord Frost uh, on all uh, uh, outstanding issues, and I think that indeed it will be very useful to continue our discussion, our dialogue, uh, and uh, maybe we can schedule our next appointment in the early autumn, where I hope that I can bring to the table additional problems which have been mentioned by the honorable members under the category of problem solved. This is what we want to do. This is what we are focusing on. And once again, uh, dear chair, thank you very much uh, for having this opportunity and uh, having uh, uh, the possibility to talk uh, to the members. Well, Vice President Safkovic, thank you very much indeed, and I hope maybe on the next occasion that we'll all be able to meet in person. But thank you very much for your time today, and, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I, and I hope the same. And all the best, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. OK, members, there's just one other item on the agenda, item three, which is any other business. Is there any other business?
then thank you very much indeed for your attendance today and it was good to see everybody in person and we'll see each other again probably virtually and on Wednesday. Thank you. We'll bring the meeting to an end. I just want to, to we have This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.